Science Communication Office Hour of the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute. Uh, the Christina Lee Brown Environment Institute is a group of integrative uh, researchers across the university and community, including physicians, scientists, engineers, epidemiologists, economists, psychologists, physiologists, statisticians, so the sociologists, and many more. And what we work to do is to turn scientific discovery into, dis into actionable knowledge. Um, so researchers within the Environment Institute study how the conditions of the human environment uh, promote health or instigate disease. And we have seven collaborative research centers that contribute. So we have this monthly science communications office hour that is live streamed on Facebook to have the opportunity to share with and hear directly from the wider community. And to learn more about the Environment Institute, please visit environmentinstitute.org. Also, you can follow us on Facebook where we are streaming now. And then you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, and also utilizing the hashtag, this is the, Envi this is Enviro, forgive me. Let me make sure I've said that correctly. This is Enviro. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Jason now to talk about one of our current events, a uh, masking campaign. All right. Thank you, Natasha. Hopefully everyone can see the screen and we could see Natasha here um, presenting uh, uh, reasons for why she masks. And so um, this is a campaign that we recently started here in the Environment Institute. Um, clearly the, the times are, are requiring us to be more vigilant about public health and taking seriously the Delta variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so here in the Institute, we've uh, started a campaign, social media campaign, describing why we mask. And so we're hoping that by informing you, everyone about why we mask, that we would encourage uh, you all out in the community uh, to also participate in this campaign. And so if you're interested in, in doing so, which we encourage, uh, please take a selfie uh, of you wearing your mask. And then just write a short note of why why you're vaccinated and or why you mask so that we can share that um, with everyone within our social media network. Um, so in doing that, please either send those selfies to um, environ at louisville.edu um, and or tag this is environ or uh, tag hashtag mask up so that we can include you in our, um, in our social media campaign. So uh, with that, I could turn it back over um, to Natasha or let's see. Yeah, excellent, thanks, Jason. Um, the, the campaign has been doing really well and we would absolutely love for uh, more people, uh, especially from the community here locally to send us their why we're masked photos and, and share their stories as well. Um, it's, for me, it's really interesting to read the reasons why and, and further inspires me and, and hopefully it has that effect far and wide. So thanks for sharing about that. And we hope that this will be a great way to get others uh, plugged in and participating as well. Um, but as COVID is fresh on the minds of many um, with the Delta variant and continuing changes, um, I think it would be very great for us to hear from Lauren about some resources that we have available and research that we're doing at this space. So we'll turn it over to Lauren. Awesome. Well, thanks, Natasha, and hey to everyone who's joining our Facebook Live uh, Science Communication Office Hour. And so we know that um, the Delta variant is alive and well, not only in Louisville, um, but just uh, everywhere across the United States. If you're watching maps like we are, it's pretty much red everywhere. And so one of the things that the University of Louisville is doing is to uh, layer community testing with sewer monitoring so we can really understand how these variants and COVID itself is moving around in our community, how infection spreads. 
And so I am excited today to share with you two things. Uh, the first will be a wastewater dashboard so that you can connect with um, our results each week. And so this is part of an effort to share back uh, the things that we are observing in, in the community so that folks know exactly what it is we're doing and why it is that we're doing them. So this is on our louisville.edu, um, University of Louisville's website, louisville.edu slash enviro and then the community project. So you can learn about the different parts of the study, the healthcare worker study, which is wrapped at this point, the community study, which is the second thing I'll talk about here in a second, and then the water study, and then this dashboard, which we will focus on first. So once you navigate to the dashboard, it's uh, really easy to understand what is going on. So this is just a, some intro language. Um, we've collected over a thousand samples at 17 different sites across Louisville since um, June of 2020. So we have a year's worth of sewer monitoring data that we can um, sort of rewind the tape and see how exactly uh, COVID in infections spread uh, throughout Louisville. We are so very proud that we are um, among the first to identify variants whenever they enter our community through the sewer monitoring efforts. So right now, all of our dashboards are focused on uh, the frequency of detection, how much of that Delta variant virus um, genetic material, RNA pieces, are in our sewer water. So you can tell trends over time and you can see, um, just like everywhere else in Kentucky and in the United States, um, everywhere is in the red zone. And you can tell that um, from the past, things are getting more red. So what we want to see are those declining rates and then you would see these red shades start to lighten. Um, and so if you just want to keep up to date about what this uh, variant is doing here in Louisville, um, I would suggest that you connect with these um, wastewater results. They are updated weekly, and so you can uh, be the first to know what's going on. And then again, I did mention that the community project is layering our data collection. So not only are we looking at wastewater, which again, you can see through this dashboard, but we have a community study and this is happening right now. And so um, we have researchers out in the field actively testing people for active infection and presence of antibodies in their bloodstream. I'm going to close this window and then draw your attention to the co-immunity flyer. All right, at this point, you should be seeing this co-immunity flyer. And so um, testing is going on through the 30th. So you have about two and a half more days now uh, to sign up and uh, make an appointment to get tested both for active infection and antibodies. And so that way you can know if you have a little bit of protection uh, from your immune system and you can know um, that you are undertaking activities safely once you receive that negative test result. So we have lots of different uh, testing sites at the U of, L, U of L Stadium, Southeast Christian Church, um, another church in Oklahoma and Tom Sawyer State Park. We would encourage anyone who is interested uh, to be tested. Uh, everyone does have to be 18 or older in order to participate. And so there are two ways to connect with the team who can help you make an appointment. And that is um, visiting this um, link right here or calling this number right here. If you take a screenshot, if you're watching on Facebook, you can um, take a picture of this QR code and uh, connect with us that way. Uh, everyone who is watching on Facebook Live has access to our feed, and so the link is also posted many times on our Facebook wall. We are so excited to invite everyone in our Louisville community to participate uh, with us uh, in this co-immunity community testing. So I would really encourage you to, to go on and sign up. And uh, if you do, you get a um, you get a gift card, I believe. Um, so sign up today. And with that, I am going to turn it on over to Jordan to talk about the Superfund project. And
Here we go, Jordan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, so as Natasha mentioned at the beginning of our session, um, the Environment Institute is composed of a number of different researchers and individuals from all types of different professional backgrounds and is also made up of several different uh, institutes or groups or cores. And one of those is the Superfund Research Center. Uh, so the Superfund Research Center is focused on looking at what are known as Superfund sites, not super fun, super fund with a D. Um, and these are sites, uh, without getting into too much detail, have some sort of environmental contamination that requires cleanup so that it is not, uh, does, is not or does not continue to be harmful to, towards the community. Um, and our research center in particular is interested in looking at this particular types of compounds that are found often on these Superfund sites, and these compounds are known as volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. So I am part of the Superfund Research Center's Community Engagement Core, and so uh, we at the Engagement Core work to help provide information to the community, to the general public, about the research at our Superfund Center, um, as well as the findings from our center and any information that the community asks for, essentially. So anything that they might be interested in learning more about that we can help provide uh, scientifically backed information for them so that they can met best make decisions about their health, about exposure to different compounds and um, about life in general. Um, so I'm showing today some fact sheets that we had made up to share with the community about volatile organic compounds or VOCs, as I will be referring to them, um, about what they are, where you're exposed to them and how that can affect your health, and then what you can do to help uh, reduce your exposure or even prevent exposure in some cases. So um, I am sharing here um, one of these fact sheets. And so this is the more general fact sheet about what are VOCs and where do they come from. So VOCs are chemicals that can vaporize at room temperature. Uh, some common examples that you might have heard of would be like formaldehyde or acetaldehyde or benzene. Many of these VOCs are naturally found in the environment. They're just naturally occurring. You might be exposed to them as you move about your day. Uh, but more often than not, a lot of these VOCs are coming from man-made sources. So we have this diagram here that shows a number of different sources, both out in the community um, or in the home. So things such as industry or car exhaust, um, smoke from things from waste management or wildfires, dust uh, from the you know, general places. Sometimes you get air quality alerts. That's actually dust coming in from like the Sahara Desert um, or different agricultural practices as farm fields are worked and release things into the air. There are also a lot of household sources, everything from the smoke from scented candles to VOCs in cosmetics, things like nail polish or hairspray, uh, fabric softener, cleaners, laundry detergent, a dry cleaning that you bring into your home. If you notice that it has a smell, uh, those are VOCs. Your new car smell, that's VOCs. So there are a number of sources, both indoors and outdoors, that you might be exposed to. Um, so why is that important to know? Um, well, because these VOCs have been linked to a number of health effects, and they're not good health effects. Uh, things like cancer, cardiovascular disease, liver or kidney damage, uh, respiratory irritation. So of course, you get a whole bunch of dust or you know pollution in your throat, you know, car exhaust, it's probably gonna make you cough. You have respiratory irritation, eye, nose and throat inflammation. So like an allergic reaction almost, uh, headaches and dizziness, uh, skin irritation. Uh, so there are a number of health effects, as I said, that have been linked to exposure to VOCs, both in the short term and the long term. And here is a slightly more detailed table looking at specific VOCs or potential sources and their known health effects. So I mentioned formaldehyde. A lot of people are familiar with formaldehyde. Um, there are some natural internal production of formaldehyde, but most of your exposure is going to come from things like combustion, so your car exhaust, cleaning products, building materials, uh, so your carpet or your new furniture or your new wood floors when you're remodeling your home can re re release formaldehyde, cigarette smoke or preservatives. Um, and formaldehyde has been linked to respiratory irritation and then it's a known carcinogen, so to cause cancer. Um, so it's really important to know where you're being exposed to VOCs and then what you can do about that. So um, I'm actually going to jump to a secondary fact sheet that we have that is looking at reducing in-home VOC exposure. So these are very practical things that you can do. Some of them are easier than others, uh, but can help 
either mitigate or prevent your exposure to a lot of your in-home VOC sources. So some good ideas to help reduce your VOC exposure in your home are to follow proper use manufacturer labels. So when you're using products such as paint or cleaners or laundry detergent, make sure you're using them how they're meant to be used. Um, the instructions on the package are designed in such a way that you're going to reduce your exposure to VOCs um, as well as other chemical compounds that might be in those uh, products. So make sure you're following the manufacturer's label. Manufacturer's label. Also make sure that you are storing these VOC containing products properly. So make sure you're not, you know, keeping paint in your living room. Uh, make sure it's, the lids are on these containers that they are being stored properly in areas with lots of ventilation as the VOCs are released uh, in aerosols. Then if they're in a larger space, it's kind of diluting the effect. So you would be reducing your VOC exposure. Um, obviously minimizing your use of these VOC containing products. So, you know, like I said, scented products such as air fresheners or candles or activities such as frying foods, make sure that, you know, you're not constantly having candles burn in your house all day long. I know I'm guilty of this some days. Um, you just want things to smell pretty, but you're actually exposing yourself to VOCs. So minimizing your use of these products can actually help reduce your own exposure. Um, there are now certain products such as paints that are being produced that are have zero or low VOC levels. So things such as paints, varnishes, sealants, adhesives, look for what you can see this little symbol here that either says zero or low. Um, and has the little gaseous little symbol that's indicating that there are low levels or no VOCs in these products. So look for those where you can uh, to help reduce your exposure there. Use proper ventilation. Again, this goes back to following the manufacturer's label and instructions. Uh, I bet your paint cans tell you to use it in a well-ventilated area. So make sure that you're following these instructions, either doing these things by oh, uh, you know, in an area where you have open windows or doors or where you're using ceiling or exhaust fans to help uh, move those VOCs out of the area. And as I said, there can be VOCs in furniture or new floors. So make sure that when you're installing new carpets, new flooring, those sorts of things, doing remodels that you have a well-ventilated area as well. And then finally, some things that you shouldn't do, don't smoke indoors. Cigarette smoke has a ton of VOCs as well as other harmful compounds that can cause your cancer, your cardiovascular disease, all sorts of things. And it's not just the smokers themselves that are affected. You get individuals that are exposed to secondhand or even thirdhand smoke when that smoke uh, settles into the carpets, into the furniture, the cushions, things like that, um, that individuals might be exposed even if they're not the smoker. So don't smoke indoors. That helps reduce your exposure to so many harmful compounds. Um, as I mentioned, uh, dry cleaned clothes, that especially if they have a smell, that's their VOC. So avoid bringing recently dry cleaned clothes indoors. And then don't keep around old or unnecessary VOC containing products. If you're seeing your paint cans are rusted, they're probably leaking something that probably is VOC. So make sure to get rid of those um, when you're done with them, when they're empty, just don't leave them sitting around. Um, and make sure if they are sitting around again, that they are sealed properly and stored properly so that um, you're not being exposed unnecessarily. There are also other ways that aren't necessarily in-home ways to reduce your exposure. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is a government agency that is in charge of these Superfund sites, they have guidelines for indoor VOC levels to help minimize exposure from building materials. So when a new building is built or uh, remodeled, they have to follow these standards to make sure that people in those buildings are not overly exposed to these compounds. Um, another source of indoor exposure is called vapor intrusion, and I won't get too much into this uh, as a lot of sources of known vapor intrusion, the individuals or uh, the people who own those buildings or sites or things like that have put in systems to help uh, reduce the exposure from vapor intrusion, which is just VOCs moving up from underground into your home through cracks in your basement or open windows, things like that. Um, so some, as I said, your VOCs from indoor products, handle those properly, make sure they're stored, don't keep them around past their expiration date. Plants can help reduce exposure, but not necessarily indoors. So health, house plants have numerous health benefits, um, but indoor VOC levels have not really been shown to be affected uh, by plants. Outdoor is a different story, and that's something that uh, a project at the Environment Institute is looking at through the Green Heart Project. 
I won't go on about that, but if you visit our webpage, you can find more information about that there. And there are also certain medical treatments for VOC exposure that are currently an important area of research. So scientists are interested in antioxidants, which lots of people have heard about, you know, this drink has antioxidants and berries have antioxidants and this, that, and the other. Uh, scientists are really looking at antioxidants to help decrease the harmful effects. So once you've already been exposed to help prevent you from having those health, out, uh, those negative health outcomes. Um, and there's actually currently a trial at U of L. It's the NEAT trial. I don't recall off the top of my head what it stands for, but the NEAT trial is actually looking at this compound carnosine, which is a naturally occurring compound that's found in muscle, brain, and heart tissue. A lot of bodybuilders can take this um, to help build up muscle, but they're looking to see if uh, if that it could be protective against VOC exposure. So the current study, the NEAT trial is looking into these preliminary effects that they've seen that show that carnosine is protective, whether that is seen in humans as well as the mouse models that they've previously used. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a set of fact sheets that the Superfund uh, Center Community Engagement Center has put together. Um, we also have additional fact sheets about other things that the community has been interested in. Uh, but these sheets, uh, if they're not already, will shortly be available up on the Center for Environmental uh, Policy and Management webpage as part of the Superfund core. So we would love to uh, have individuals look at these. If they have any questions, can uh, contact the core um, and feel free to share them as you will, as you think people are interested in VOCs or learning more about ways they can protect themselves and uh, protect their health from VOC exposure. And with that, I'll open it up to the rest of you guys if you have any questions. Well, excellent presentation, Jordan, and I love the resources that you've shared and excited that will be that everyone will have access to them soon from the website. And so I got a quick question for you. Sure thing. Um, is, yeah, you, you shared very clearly um, the many ways that we can be exposed to VOCs. Are there some populations or some groups of people that might be more susceptible uh, to the, the health threats that VOCs bring? Yeah, so uh, there have been several studies looking um, at just specific populations, and it's known in general that a lot of times your uh, African American communities or uh, other low income communities are found in areas where there's a lot more industry. So basically industry can come into these areas without as much of a fuss and just start doing their thing. Um, so they have found that a lot of these uh, more disadvantaged, uh, lower income uh, African American communities uh, you know, are being more exposed to these VOCs as well as other pollutants from these industries or from highways, you know, they build highways more commonly through the neighborhood. So there is uh, some evidence already, but then where there's a, a greater push now uh, to kind of look at um, different populations and seeing how they may be affected differently in terms of po uh, pollution exposure, VOC exposure, that sort of thing. And, and that's really important because then we can get more personalized care and we can also provide data to promote policy that helps reduce exposure to these communities. Um, but the, so the research is, research is always ongoing. I feel like that's always said, like the research is ongoing, um, but there is certainly evidence showing that there are uh, disparities uh, in the health effects between different populations and especially when it comes to VOCs. So it's really important uh, for everyone to know about VOC exposure, but it is more of concern for those uh, populations that are seeing heavier exposure, especially due to industry. Uh, thanks so much, Jordan. And are there others uh, in our team that have questions for Jordan about the resources that she shared? Yeah, Jordan, thank you. Uh, what a wealth of knowledge. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, I just had a quick question. I was curious if, if the Superfund Research Center has done any um, exposure testing in preclinical models. And if so, uh, would you be able to share uh, some of those results just in kind of, you know, at, at, I'm recalling something about benzene and insulin resistance, but I'm not sure I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, I, I know personally we have done, uh, I, part of my research was looking at um, cigarette smoke and we weren't specifically looking at VOCs, uh, but we were looking at different compounds. We were looking, 
we were specifically looking at some VOCs. So we were looking at formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, crotonaldehyde, and acrolein, uh, which I mentioned the formaldehyde in particular is cancer causing. And um, all of these, we were looking more in terms of cigarette smoke, as well as e-cigarette aerosol, uh, which is known to have a number of VOCs as well. Um, and that's certainly still ongoing research. Um, and we found actually that um, exposure to acrolein and formaldehyde and crotonaldehyde in particular, uh, not so much acetaldehyde, but caused a lot of basically damage in the vasculature uh, without going into too much detail. They showed that uh, there was damage in terms of changes in blood pressure or vascular reactivity. So how well your, your vessels respond when there's any sort of you know, changes in blood pressure up down as you move and go about your day. Um, and then we're also decreases in the cells that can help repair the vasculature. Um, so that was some research that I personally was involved in. Uh, I know there has been uh, studies that have looked at the insulin resistance and things like that, showing that you do see increases in insulin resistance with exposure. Uh, we haven't looked at every VOC, obviously, but I know acrolein uh, is a big one that's studied in our group. Um, and even in healthy you know, individuals that translates to into completely healthy individuals, young individuals that don't have any other in the underlying health conditions that you still see these effects. So what we're seeing in the preclinical models are often translating directly into human, uh, to human populations as well. Um, but of course, research is still ongoing. So we still got more VOCs to keep testing. And I know the Superfund program is kind of trying different VOCs to see if there are different effects between like benzene or crolein, this, that, and the other, um, just to see how we can best protect ourselves with known sources of these VOCs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, great questions and um, really excellent insights and resources. So thank you so much, Jordan. And we have breaking news. So we'll turn it back to Lauren for our breaking news. Awesome. Thank you, Natasha. And um, before I jump into our breaking news, I will say in the comments, I did um, put the NEAT trial link that Jordan was just talking about. So if anyone would like to connect with that clinical trial, uh, we are recruiting people and uh, you can find all the information there at that site. And so on to our breaking news. I am excited to share this week's um, Frequency of detection or how much uh, Delta variant uh, genetic material uh, RNA fragments uh, can be found in Louisville's sewer system. If you were with us just a few moments ago, um, this map would look very similar to the one from last week. Uh, these, this whole area of central and eastern uh, Jefferson County they all had the same level of Delta variant found there this week. The same is true for the very westernmost uh, part of our county, where we are seeing an increasing uh, amount of the Delta variant here in Louisville is now right here. This is inside the Waterson Expressway, um, and it is expanding from downtown Louisville southward uh, through U of L campus and approaching um, the the waters and express expressway right here. So how we can understand this map is that uh, things are holding steady all around uh, the county, except for this middle area um, extending from downtown Louisville uh, to the Waterson Expressway um, just south of UofL campus, where we are seeing increasing levels of uh, virus material. So. Um, because we just did uh, receive these results during this call, we thought it would be um, timely to share these results with you now. In about an hour, uh, this map will also appear on that dashboard uh, that we reviewed earlier. Lauren, can I just ask a quick question, actually? Yes. So the areas that are not red, that doesn't mean there's no variant being detected there or are those are just areas that we're, we don't have access to the wastewater to actually test? These are different um, catchment areas and so these are um, small catchments 
We have results for the gray areas as well. Those results are coming from pump stations and water treatment facilities. And so we don't have um, such a granular or um, close up look at the areas in, uh, in gray. So our most detailed information is coming from um, these catchment areas, these shapes that you can see right here. Whenever we would like to tell um, a larger story, uh, we then focus on those treatment centers and the pump stations to color in our knowledge where these great areas are. That was a great question, thank you. Perfect, thank you. All right. And since I do have the reins, um, I will uh, go ahead and transition, if it's okay with Dr. DeCharnett, uh, to talk about upcoming events. And I will share about the next Green Heart Community Conversation with Dr. Andrea Derrick uh, on September 22nd. And so if you would like uh, to attend that community conversation, uh, you can email um, us, greenheartlouisville at gmail.com, or you can join uh, via Zoom at this link down here. Um, this flyer is also posted on the um, Envirom's Facebook wall, so you will be able to um, see that link there and choose to connect with that community conversation uh, should you like. And again, um, the email address to, to know more about this or to get that Zoom link sent directly to you is greenheartlouisville at gmail.com. All right, and I'm going to stop sharing this and um, hand it over to Natasha. Great. Well, um, thank you for sharing about the Green Heart Community Conversation that's coming up very soon. Hopefully, um, those that are watching will also share the word with their contacts and networks as well. Um, also coming up, we have a super fun community advisory board meeting where um, our, one of our very own researchers um, from Green Heart Louisville and uh, definitely from super, our super fun research team, Dr. Jay Turner, will be sharing about air monitoring plans here in Louisville and, um, and how he'll be leading this work within the Superfund study. That's gonna take place on September 15th at noon, also on Zoom. Um, and to find out more information or to make sure you're on the list there, please email Dr. Lauren Heverly at lauren.heverly, and that's H-E-B-E-R-L-E at louisville.edu. Superfund has been busy because we are just on the heels of our most recent Superfund community engagement, community knowledge exchange session. And uh, that took place in the last hour. Uh, so the next knowledge exchange session will happen later this fall. But today we discussed legacy sites of VOCs that Jordan was sharing about before and vapor intrusion. And then we will learn in the next community engagement session around active sites. Does anyone else in the group have any other upcoming events to share? Well, that is plenty. <laughs> so we certainly hope that um, those of you that are watching this video will be able to join, take part, weigh in, and contribute to these conversations that are coming up. Um, but also, we want to make sure you're aware that our next um, live science communications office hours will take place on September 24th at 1 p.m. And we'd love to hear you, see you here again, same time and same place, live streams on Facebook. Thank you so much for joining our science communication office hour today. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us with comments, feedback, um, if you have any comments uh, on what you've seen in today's video, please leave a comment right there on the Facebook video. You can also email us at environ.global.edu, and you're welcome to visit our website, environinstitute.org. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you um, to our science communication team also for all of your work. Thanks. <laughs>